Hello everyone and welcome to our very first episode of The Indie Agenda, a weekly gaming podcast featuring indie news and exclusive interviews. I'm your host Kez, also known as Kez Lequescent, here to bring you everything you missed last month and everything you want to look forward to for next month. Our guest for this episode is the Graham ZA, a writer for a myriad of indie games. Join us later as we will talk about his career in indie development and some games that inspired him. And let's get started with the indie agenda. First off, we've got Spell Rogue. This is a quite anticipated game from the developers of Deep Rock Galactic. They released a playtest uh, update in June. If you want to join that playtest, then you can uh, sign up on Steam. And uh, Spell Rogue, by the way, is an anticipate, like a highly anticipated dice-based roguelike deck builder. Very interesting to- choice of genres, and I'm actually kind of looking forward to seeing what they, they make of it. IGN and ID at Xbox had a collab event where they had an indie game showcase. A bunch of demos were showcased between the 11th and the 17th of July. If you missed that, don't worry about it. IGN has got you. They put together a playlist of all the games that they showcased and the link is in our description below. Strange Horticulture has been announced for a release on Xbox on August the 17th, so if you are a an Xbox lover and you really enjoy indie games and a little bit of mystery, then uh, grab some strange horticulture. Funkle announces couch co-op mode for vampire survivors uh, that is going to be released on August the 17th on all platforms. This was announced along with a Nintendo Switch release. It was kind of like hidden in the middle of everything they were like oh we're coming out on nintendo switch by the way also couch co-op for like two seconds and we were like hang on what yep that's vampire survivors for you uh next up is super auto pets this is like a cute auto battler they are set for a big update to include spectator mode and ranked mode uh which is something that i'm personally looking forward to now stardew valley news had concerned ape tweeting out that there will be a 1.6 update on the way with some very vague um with some very vague inclusions uh which are i quote new festival new items more dialogues secrets and question mark question mark question mark that's it okay hope you're looking forward to that Announced later this year is indie symphony this is a special event that will arrive later in the year I believe that they're going to be performing this in Australia. So this will be a celebration of all things indie game music. Uh, It's two hours long and they will be featuring music from Celeste, Journey, Transistor, Hades, Stray Gods and Hollow Knight. So if you're a fan and you are finding yourself in Australia whenever it is that they're going to be announcing it later in the year, then absolutely get yourself some tickets to watch this. Um, it, It looks really spectacular. I am jelly. Cook, serve, delicious, remastered. This will come out on the on in twenty twenty four for PC and consoles. There's a brand new campaign, new modes, new features, and so much more. Also announced for the Cook, serve, delicious franchise is an update to the early access release of Cook, serve, forever. That'll come out in August, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, before we move on to our trailers. Um, I want to give a shout out to Dear Indie Games. They have compiled a very comprehensive calendar of all indie releases, you know, last month, this month, to come, whatever. They're an amazing resource. We, you know, this channel by all means, or this podcast by all means, is not going to be covering all the releases. So if you want an extensive look at all the all the releases, then you can find that link in the description below. Um, Dear Indie Games, you can also follow them on, on most platforms. On to, on to uh, June and July releases. So first up, we have 20 Minutes Till Dawn that came out on June the 8th. This has been an early access for a while and it's enjoying a full release at the moment. This is a survival roguelite with endless hordes of creatures attacking you. You've got to collect your, your experience points very much in the vein of vampire survivors, but they definitely have a bit of a twist. So if this is a genre that you quite enjoy, then definitely pick up 20 Minutes Till Dawn. 
Next up, we've got Vactex. Now, this is quite an interesting kind of chess-like strategy game where the war has already been over or the heroes have fallen and you and the citizens need to fight for a better future. All the, um, all the levels are randomly generated as well, which is very, very interesting. So if you really like some, some tactical games, then uh, definitely check that one out. Kingdom has released a kind of a standalone expansion to the Kingdom franchise. Kingdom 80s is kids on bikes, um, but it's Kingdom. So there's still the base building mechanics. There is still uh, the strategy game involved uh, that you would find in a Kingdom game. So this is this is pretty much really, really good. Sorry, I, I went outside to go fetch my food and there's like a little bit of rain on my glasses. <laughs> Anyway, um, on to July releases. July the 12th saw Oxenfree 2 come out. Um, this is, oh, this is such a nice game. I actually grabbed it on mobile. They, they did a release for it on Netflix. And, oh, I enjoyed it so much. Very well optimized for mobile as well. Um, it's, it's a, this is a spooky mystery. It takes place in a small town. Uh, be prepared for, like, glitches and radio talk and amazing voiceover and a highly captivating story even if you haven't played oxenfree one uh you can still play oxenfree two i actually downloaded oxenfree one after i played oxenfree two and i'm looking forward to tuck into that this weekend so uh grab that on uh, whatever platform you wish uh then ember nights came out on july the 17th uh i believe it was an early access and this is a, a full full release this is an action roguelite. Um, what's quite interesting about this one is that it's got co-op for up to four players. And, you know, it's it's your your usual roguelite fair. You, you've got weapons and you've got skills. You've got a whole bunch of synergies. You can play it with friends. Uh, you've got like a massive scythe, which always like makes me feel excited. I, I, I love me a scythe in, in, in any game. So, yeah. Um, I think I'm going to be checking out Emma Knights. Uh, I think they also announced a sequel soon. So that's very interesting. Uh, Sticky Business is a lovely little game. Very, very casual where you are a, like, you own a small business of building stickers. So there's like a lovely sticker editor. Uh, you got you to gotta print out your stickers. You got you to gotta put your stickers out in a big sheet. Try to, try to make take as, as much space as possible or at least like try to arrange them in a in a in in a, the best arrangement trying to get as many stickers on the page there you go as possible <laughs> we got there eventually and then you got to pack the stickers in cute little little boxes with straw and whatever so you will get your you'll get your orders in from your fake etsy shop and you got to pack in the pack in every order uh for creators it's got a really nice little twitch integration so yeah i, I played the demo back at steam next fest and this instantly grabbed me you can also like export your stickers and make stickers out of the stickers that you make in the sticker game so absolutely worth it full void this came onto the list because of how beautiful the graphics are they do sell themselves as like a cinematic 2d puzzle platformer so think along the lines of or i'm thinking along the lines of limbo because it is a young teenage girl that is escaping this hostile world controlled controlled by rogue ai so limbo and um man what was the other game but but limbo um limbo had like a, a very similar vibe to it but this oh man the, the pixel graphics here look absolutely amazing also reminds me a little bit of katana zero but you know this is a this is a, a puzzle platformer not an action game so definitely wish this this game if if this is is tickling your fancy next up is roto force um this came out on july the 19th this is kind of like a, like the world is constantly rotating the levels are pretty frantic um you can unlock weapons you fight lots of bosses you gotta you gotta be on the move all the time i really like the concept of this game uh these small tiny little games just always grab me so i'm gonna think i'm gonna pick up rotor force pretty soon 
Legberg Legacies came out on July the 20th. This is quite an interesting game. So it 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 puts together, you know, like romance, like visual novels, but also like a village management simulator. So you got to play matchmaker with your villagers to make sure that your kingdom thrives. Uh, and then you can be like, you know, the king, um, which is which is quite interesting. Um, the last indie on this list is Venba. Now, Venba is really close to my heart. So you play as an Indian immigrant mom. She immigrates to Canada with her family in the 80s. And the whole thing about this game is you cook dishes, you know, from your home. So there's a lot of Indian dishes. Like, this is very authentic. Like, the sound design is... You know, if, if you are hearing something being like cook, uh, uh, um, mixed together, you know, like chicken in like a like a marinade or something, it, it is literally, you know, the sound is the chicken in that marinade. So it's 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 such a beautiful game. I've been wanting to play this game for two years and I'm so glad it's finally coming out. So, yeah, this releases on the 31st. So definitely grab this. If you love cooking, if you love a good story, you will most likely cry absolutely stunning then we're on to our announcements so coming up in august we have this cute a minimalist game called thronefall this is set to release on august the 2nd this game looks absolutely beautiful i love i love the minimalist aesthetic and like a like a little kingdom defense game definitely tickles my fancy so i'm definitely going to be playing this on august 2nd uh when, when, when it does come out uh what was also announced for august the third is a game called sushi for robots um this is like a an automation game a little automation puzzle game where you have to have the right match the right sushi for the correct robots so the patrons are quite picky and you need to set up your conveyor belt to make sure that you, you know, deliver the right sushi to the right robot. So kind of Factorio vibes, but not really. Um, I thought this was quite interesting. I, I love the look of it and the puzzles seem quite like unique. So yeah, let's, let's check this out. Coming out on August the 3rd. This roguelike game is called Plong. It's like a <laughs> it's like an arcade game um, where you gotta make upgrades every playthrough and therefore you you gotta you gotta use those upgrades to stay one step ahead of the security forces hunting you down. This kind of feels like 90s or early 2000s like um, UI um i i saw this on twitter as well or x or whatever the heck it's called <laughs> and i don't know it it just it's very unique it's very charming i think i definitely want to want to pick up plong uh next up is a game that i also played during next fest this uh was also announced to release on the 7th of August, just in time for Steam's Visual Novel Fest. So this game, I believe, is set in 2003, and it follows those that the aesthetic, but also like the, the feel of the internet in that era, especially with communities and forums. During the demo, I found myself kind of First of all, like custom immediately customizing my um, my profile. Like that was the first thing that I did, and the second thing was just going through all the posts and checking. Okay, who has replied to me and who has said something? Can I add something? Oh, let's like this. Like just going through every single forum, chatting to friends, posting your own artwork, and it's just got such a like a lovely aesthetic to it. And I actually can't wait to see. What will come about uh, out of it? So it was a very pleasant find in Steam Next Fest, and I'm also pleasantly surprised that it's coming out on August seventh, which is like really, really, really soon. And then finally, there was also an announcement for Stray Gods. So 
uh, because of the release of Baldur's Gate 3 on August the 3rd, Stray Gods have um, elected to move their, um, their release to August 10th so that, uh, so that players could experience the game fully. You know, they could get Baldur's Gate 3 out of their system and then they could focus on Stray Gods. So if you don't know what Stray Gods is, this is set in a modern fantasy world the a grace who is the main character is given the power of the of a muse basically this is a role playing musical so um even if you 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 played the demo you were you you sing the musical and then you, then you've got choices within the music and that kind of dictates decisions and outcomes and also how the song sounds at the end of the day whether you go into a duet or a trio or solo I really like the dynamicism of music here, but it also is set in with like, you know, as a visual novel. Um, I quite like how they've kind of bent various genres, you know, some genres that are not even used in games all that much. So very, very interested to see what Stray Gods has to offer. And finally, before we go on to our interview with the Graham ZA, I just want to cover um, games that were released, or at least indie games that were released on a PC Game Pass in the last month. Now, I'm not sponsored by Xbox or Game Pass or anything like that, but I think it is a highly valuable service in terms of how much money you spend and how many games you get to play. Right now, Look, I'm as a South African, I think I'm paying like 80 Rand for, to have access to over 100 games. And they are games that come and go, which is absolutely fine. More often than not, I end up playing the games. It's also a really good service that you can use to just, you know, to just try out a game before you actually buy it. Um, but either way, you are going to be supporting the you are going to be so supporting the indie devs directly, whether you play it on Game Pass, whether you pe uh, pick it up on, on Steam, on Epic, on uh, the PlayStation Store, on the Xbox Store. So, yeah, as long as you're playing the game, you're supporting the indies. So, last month, uh, or at least um, indies that came out on PC Game Pass, uh, first of all, is Common Hood. This is a lovely little game where you where you build like a, a commune, like a community and everything that, that goes towards it or uh, it's together. McPixel 3 is <laughs> quite an interesting combination of things. I don't really want to say too much about it, but this is, this is quite an interesting release that came out. Um, Arcade Paradise is all about, is, is all about managing an, an, like an arcade like your own arcade so you could choose which the machine which machines get put on your office hours like how much the how much money the machine will take like everything that goes into like the maintenance and running of like an arcade store it's also a uh, like a, a first person game as well bookwalker this is something that's very interesting now um people it, it's a first person game but it also is it's a narrative game as well of some some features are also inspired by Disco Elysium. When you play the game, you will understand. It's it's like the artwork and also the panel on the side that pops up with all of your all of your choices. But then it also has this fun mechanic where okay, cool, you're first person in like the real world, and then you are like there's this top down isometric view of you in the book world so you can actually go into a book you you have these missions to either like retrieve something from a book because you are like serving time as a writer in like some kind of like police state country very very 1985 vibes like very much all well and so when you're in the book you get this this top down view and then you you can interact with with various elements and you can actually go between the two you can you can go into the real world and you can get a, a tool like a lockpick or a mallet and go back to the book world and apply it there. So very interesting concept. The execution, 
it's you you got to be patient with the execution i i think but like definitely check it out if you want something different if you definitely want something different i quite enjoyed the first like half an hour or so of 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 of, of what i had played um door 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 don i think it's it's called this is an absolutely beautiful game it's like it's like a really sweet little casual game that i can't wait to to get into venba is coming out on pc game pass which i am so super excited about that will happen at the end of the month um and then figment 2 uh creed valley is also set to come out on game pass the, this is this is a wonderful game um it it is kind of co-op but if you've got a kid and you just want to play a game with them and they they want to be involved but they don't have any kind of direct consequences then this is definitely a game that you can play with with your kid but figment 2 is really cool it all takes place in the kind of mind of a man think think along the lines of psychonauts but um yeah one of the cool things on one of the many cool things is that you have like a piano bridge in there and that's that's really really cool celeste is also coming to to pc game pass this is a very famous um platformer that deals with themes of like depression and acceptance and loss and love very 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 beautiful game and more people get to play it now that it's on game pass the wandering village is also coming to game pass along with a nice big update so wandering village is is basically a city builder but you are you are building on the back of this moving creature and the creature and like and you know its excretions and kind of body um like you know uh what do you call that resources um can be used in the maintenance of your village so there's like a a mutual um, a mutual agreement happening there and then you also have to choose the path that the animal takes and that also has some effect on your village whether you go through places that have like heavy rain or no rain or that have like a fog or you know very very interesting game um and they they're also releasing an update i think it's still in early access then we've got maquette which is an interesting first person puzzle game it looks very very beautiful other than that i don't know much toem is also releasing on pc game pass also such a stunning game that has broken a lot of rules and introduced some features that felt quite ahead of its time this is basically like a photo taking game yeah i i think it's i think it's uh it quite a cool game definitely want to experience and um oh, more people get to experience it so we're going to be moving on to our um interview segment i hope that you enjoy so um our guest for this month is the graham zene hello and welcome to india agenda um tell us about yourself and give us a brief chat about your career as a dev so far so my screen name is the Graham ZA. My real name is Graham Fundamata, and I have a pen name called Graham Peter, which I do most of my writing under. Uh, I started games writing in about 2017. I was doing B2B freelance writing, and one of my clients was a, a venture capital firm, and they were like, well, we've just invested in this game, which was uh, called Augmenters, and uh, we need a bit of help with some of the marketing, some of the law and you know you want to help us out i was like yeah sure they've done this before i've just been a journalist i've just been a copywriter uh that was really cool i enjoyed it and then at the end of 2020 i was in a an e-commerce job that i hated absolutely despised and i was like i have to get out of this so 31st december that year i started going through all the games that i like and created this huge spreadsheet of different developers and then I went through top 10 lists and then genres are like, and I just had a list of like a hundred devs and I just blank emailed all of them saying, Hey, I'm a freelance writer. Do you have any use for me? Anything? I don't mind. I'll work for free. I just want my name in the credits. Lots of, uh, ghosting, 
a few rejections, but three came back to me and said, hey, we actually have a couple projects. We're looking for a writer. And yeah, that's that's kind of how I got started. That's actually really cool. I never even thought that you could just email devs and be like, hey, <laughs> do you need a writer? It's so great that they can back to you. It's probably not the best strategy. Um, a lot of the companies are like, oh, go look at, our, look at our jobs page and you know, we'll let you know if we have a project. And a lot of games writing is it's luck and it's timing because you've got to get in at the beginning. But no one really advertises when they're you know, in, in the process of creating a project. There's a lot of hush hush. Mm. So uh, definitely a lot of luck on my side. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, and so what was the role in each of in each of these games? I'm assuming it was like the same kind of role, but like, how did you uh, go about writing the, the, the story? Or was it necessarily story? Was it like prompts? Was it like everything in the UI? Like... It very much depends on the title. So there were two games, uh, Life of Fly 2 and One Last Memory, where the dev was like, I've bought some assets, uh, here are some levels, go play this Unity build and then just write stories. And that was kind of cool, and I, I got to kind of go wild with that. I, was, uh, so I enjoyed it. Learning, definite learning experience. Um, then I had Residual from Orange Pixel, uh the dev pascal said uh, you know i've got some lines i'm not happy with them what can you do with them so edited a bunch of lines and some item descriptions and my one of the clients i have now called uh, herocraft pc which is a publisher they're like hey we've got a couple games we need some help uh, on the english side of things because they're not an english company they needed help uh, editing marketing copy copy uh and writing the stories and stuff that they're like hey we've got a few things just try it let's see what happens um so yeah it, it, there's there's a lot of editing there's a lot of translation that i do uh mostly from russian to english i'm not a russian speaker google <laughs> google translate <laughs> helps me out there so do you but do you do it, you just like google translate the russian and then you kind of piece together or how does that yeah, work <laughs> pretty much that's that there's a big part of the process. Like they'll also give me lines that are already translated, and you have to kind of piece, go through them, figure out like what are they trying to say? What is the context for this? Uh, there have been some very interesting results to that. Um, I don't know what NDA is at the moment, so I can't name like some of the projects I've worked on, but I can allude to certain things. So one of the games, the main character comes goes back to his old town to restart his father's business. And he, he has a, a nemesis in the game and uh, the love of his life. And the love of his life doesn't, isn't too interested in him at the moment. And when I edited the text, the way it was written or the way that Google spat it out is that he, the love interest was already married to the nemesis and you were basically going to break up their marriage. And I was like, it's interesting. That's new. That's not in all games. I'll go for it. <laughs> and then they came back to me. They were like, no, 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 actually, no one's married. There's nothing like that. You just have to win her heart. So that was a cool. That was that was interesting. Uh, definitely taught me to ask more questions of my clients. Yeah. Um, so in terms of communicating with them, do you just kind of check in with them every week with here is what I've got? Uh, kind of like in the film world with like film school compo composers sitting down with directors or uh, do they not ask you for anything for like two months and they're like, hey, how's the writing going? Uh, I have had clients that are like that. Um, it's cool to have that freedom, but then I'm also a procrastinator. So it'll be like a few weeks, like a week or two before deadline. I'm like, oh crap, I haven't written anything yet. So I should probably do something before they ask me what's going on. Um, but with a lot of them, it'll be on a, a per project basis and a per sub project basis. So they'll be like, okay, here's some marketing copy for like the next Steam Fest. It's happening in a couple of days. Just, you know, if you can edit it tomorrow kind of thing. When it comes to the localization, I usually have a couple of weeks to work on it, uh, two to three weeks. Um, that's, that's sometimes pretty heavy stuff. Like you have a couple thousand lines to go through and it's all this huge spreadsheet. 
uh, and yeah, the story takes a bit of time, um, especially in the other projects that I've had to work on remolding their law and creating like proper backstory. That's they'll I'll have a couple of weeks uh, deadline and then we'll do a, a to and fro process like, hey, how what do you think of this draft? What do you think of these characters? Blah, blah, blah. OK, cool. Yeah. Um, that's always really interesting. You just un like lift the veil of game dev, um, especially as a player. So um, what was the most fun part of working on the game? Or if if uh, working on a game is not necessarily fun all the time, you can also <laughs> you can also uh, tell us about the hardest part of working on a game or you can just do both. Uh, the hardest part is definitely the localization stuff. Uh, sometimes the time frames are, I'd like a bit more time to them. Um, so I'll be sitting, sitting going through about like five to 6,000 lines every night for a week, wow. just to try and get stuff out for early access or like if there's a new build coming out. But that, that's, that's not often. Uh, the most fun is definitely creating uh, stories that I love. Uh, it's a re out, so I can probably talk about it. Uh, Organs, Please by Herocraft. Um, I got to run a bit wild and I got to create this like timeline of events of like how the world went to shit and how civilization rebuilt itself and who the main factions are. And I incorporated South Africans as like sort of not evil, but uh, uh, one of the bad guys going <laughs> on like. I mean, we're bad guys in a lot of things like Far Cry 2 and like the Dark Angel TV series. So I was kind of drawing from that stuff. <laughs> um, but yeah, creation creation's the best part. And it's the most fun, the most enjoyable part, and most fulfilling part about writing to me. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I guess that's a good thing that you're a story writer <laughs> or like a, like a writer. Um, what? What was the most interesting challenge you faced um, when releasing a game? So I don't know if you work with, uh, as a writer, if writers work with the team, like uh, in, the, in the weeks leading up to release. I don't know what that looks like. Uh, same answer as, as, as earlier, where it's, it's kind of a per project basis. Okay. Um, a lot of the projects I've just kind of been given ideas and like, here's an early build, and you know, this is kind of what we want to get out of the story. This is where we want to go for characters. This is the end game. There's a project I'm working on at the moment where I'm working directly with the developer this time. He has a story outline. He's written like a bunch of documentation, but we need to revamp a lot of the content. Uh, and it's it's quite a challenge because you're trying to is the specific game is a roguelite, so you're trying to build a story around a game. With a player, you, you also have to incentivize the player running through the game multiple times to unlock more of the story. And it's a hell of a challenge because it's not linear in the way you just say, oh, when you meet this character every time, they're like, oh, well, what are you buying? What are you selling? You know, they, they kind of have to change up their dialogue and their text every time. And that's, that's it's been challenging. It's fun. Uh, <laughs> It's a fun project, but uh, it's it's definitely uh, challenging the way that I write stories. Mm, yeah, I mean, like uh, the roguelike that I or roguelike that I really enjoy the story of is obviously Hades, um, mm, and the yes. way that they made like the story progression a roguelite as well, um, mm. and it it just like kind of incorporated all of that in there is is something that I never found with any kind of other roguelite games. Um, they just did that writing incredibly well. Yeah, that is that is uh, something I'm drawing a bit, a bit basis from. Uh, also from Boyfriend Dungeon as well. Really enjoyed that. Uh, it also depends on like the scope of the project because you you don't obviously have years to work on projects. And something I haven't mentioned earlier is I prefer working with indies. I prefer multiple projects, smaller scope projects, as opposed to like these big blockbusters. That's, that's not for me. The fun mm -hmm. games, not for me. Um, so there's also the time constraint you have to work within. So you, you don't have months and months and months to plan out a story and every intricate detail. It's like, there are a couple of weeks, you know, we gotta get something in early access and get it out now. Uh, so yeah, get, uh, I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> scope. scope is the thing. Scope is the thing that I don't think a lot of 
uh, gamers take into account scope in development. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I've just heard like the term scope creep being thrown around yeah. and how this is something that every indie deals with. And we're like, I don't know, we just kind of deal with the with the end result and it's great. Yay. <laughs> yeah, there are a couple games. There's one game, I'll mention it, but it definitely had scope creep in it. It didn't work out too well in the end. If they'd stuck to the original idea, it would have been great, but it just kind of... It, uh, but it's the thing, it, it, it depends about the, with the dev you're working with. Do they want to chase trends? Uh, do they just want a single story or a single gameplay mechanic to focus on? It's kind of up to them. It's, it's not really in the writer's hands. Yeah, tough. Um, so you've worked on a bunch of different games. Which was your mm. favorite game? Do you, have, do you have a favorite game that you worked on? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Is this... Hmm. There's too many to mention. Organs, please. Uh, and that's because I got to run wild with a lot of the stuff. That was really, really fun. And I got to base a lot of it on one of my favorite movies, which is Idiocracy. Uh, the current game, the roguelike, uh, also enjoying that. And that's got a lot of uh, religious undertones to it. It's not mentioning much, but warping religion. Which is one of my favorite things as well. I like blasphemous. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of. Like I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a little bit from like uh, Spawn's uh, God Slayer mini series and Neon Genesis Evangelion oh. for, for some of the lore. Um, I mean, things might change, but that's current draft. Dope. Uh, and Residual was really cool uh, from Orange Pixel, and that's different to the other ones because that actually opened up a community to me. Uh, I made a lot of friends through developing that game. I became friends with the developer. And uh, when I went overseas last year to the Netherlands, I could stay with him and his wife. And it just like, you know, built a friendship. It went from a client to a friendship. And yeah, that was, that's, that's definitely one of my favorite experiences as well. Cool. Mm. That's so cool. Yeah, especially, I suppose, I mean, uh, this is going on a little bit of a tangent, but. Yep. I feel like a vast majority of indies are, or indie developers are like European, or at least yeah. at least the ones that I've encountered from, you know, especially kind of the West European, but you do you do have some from Eastern European, and it's just like it's such a different context that they come from. Um, yeah, it's uh, I've discovered that as well. Like, I mean, I'm also often trawling like job boards and stuff to find new projects. So you kind of have to be on the go constantly as a, a freelance writer. And a lot of the work does come from like Russia and Poland. There's a huge development scene in those countries, yeah. and it's incredible. And it's something that the more westernized countries don't really take notice of. Okay. Um, yeah. but what is a good example? Papers, please. I think it's a really good example. And Beholder as well. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think I remember like what, one of the big kind of indie festivals. Uh, I think it was like either a day of the devs or something and we were doing a recording mm. and, and my chat and I were, were kind of saying, oh no, this dev is from this and this dev is from that. And we were like, every every third dev or so, we were like, this guy's Polish. Yeah. He's also Polish. Yeah. She's Polish too. What? <laughs> so yeah, definitely. Um, okay. So I also want to talk about the roles outside of writing narrative just a little bit more uh, sure. because that also just includes writing. So. Um, I'm assuming that it's marketing. So if you're kind of doing a lot of social media things, are you writing, you know, Steam pages? Are you making websites? Um, yeah, what, what, what does that look like a little bit? I do have a background in marketing. I've done, I've been in quite a few copywriting roles and marketing roles. Uh, so that is something I do pitch to game studios as well. Um, so far, I've just helped a lot of people with editing copy. Uh, again, it's the localization thing. They'll write something in a different language and try to put it in English for social media for the Western market. Uh, and it's it's creating press releases when there's the early access builds or there's a big sale on. Um, it's general marketing stuff. It's 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 not super exciting, you know. It's not as fun as the narrative side of things, but it's just trying to get things out there and making it sound good. Okay. And interesting, and so you can pull in like streamers like yourself. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> Into yeah, the whole whole marketing tactic. Um, yeah. so I guess that you wouldn't be responsible for all the marketing. You would just be the copywriter. Yeah, I'm the assistant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Assist assistant to the to the marketing <laughs> assistant to the <laughs> assistant to the regional manager. Um, <laughs> I mean, a lot of them just have an idea of what they want to do, and I let them run wild. And then I come in and clean it up. Yes, yes. And I'll, I'll use whatever experience I have in the past to kind of help them boost posts and stuff. Okay. And I suppose in bigger teams, um, the, the writer definitely wouldn't be fiddling with all of this. But sometimes, you know, with smaller teams, like, you know, Flambeer used to be, what, two or three people. Mm. And you would have one person just embodying like 15 different roles or whatever. Um, I suppose in, in bigger teams, you would have your own marketing team and like your own mm -hmm. writing team. Yeah. And things. So I do got to ask, what are you playing right now? Or what have you been playing recently? I have been playing Yakuza Kiwami 2. I love the Yakuza series. And I know I didn't, I mentioned that I'm not a fan of working on big budget games, but I would love to work on a Yakuza game. <laughs> yeah, they're so, so kooky. They're so good. Uh, uh, yeah. I've got all of them in physical. Like they are one of the few games that I now pre-order and make sure I have a physical copy. They're so good. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, so playing Kiwami Two, uh, Octopath Traveler, as well. Uh, I had to restart it. I was playing it on Game Pass, but I came in very late, and then I got removed from Game Pass. So then I rebought it on the Switch. And I'm, I'm playing through it again, or um, I'm trying to get back to where I was. Uh, what else am I playing? What else am I playing? Uh, a bit of Oblivion. I get an itch now and then for it. Elder Skyrim is much better, but I don't know. This there's like there's a bit of this jank love with Oblivion. I don't know how else to describe it. Uh, I just I hate going through the intro section. It takes so stupidly long. Yeah, coming out of the dungeon with the king and uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Patrick Stewart saves it, but it's just too long. And I, I really hope with the next game they cut down. Even Skyrim's intro just takes too long when you've played it for like the hundredth time. Oh, uh, absolutely. Like, why can't you just say, you know, create character and then skip to end of dragon sequence? <laughs> and Final Fantasy VI as well. I picked up the Pixel Remaster a little while ago. Oh, lovely. Uh, it's something I never got through properly and I'm... I'm Trying to push through it now. I think we're in Lord of Ruin, the second or third act now. Oh, lovely. But yeah, yeah, a lot of RPGs. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different ones. Like, uh, Final Fantasy VI is definitely one of my favorites of the series. Um, mm. I played it, it, it got me through matric, <laughs> matric exams. Uh, I had a, like one of those SNES um, emulators. And okay. I just kind of, I had a whole bunch of like, uh, ROM games in there and Final Fantasy was one of them and I'm like okay let's try it because I had played like 10 and 12 and 7 and mm. yeah and 10 to um, at that stage so I'm like okay let's try 6 let's see and I loved it Lord. I uh, also discovered it in high school um, but I had it on, on PS1 I had, my friends and I had just come off uh, playing through 7 and 8 and I got my Playstation shipped and for your non-South African audiences, piracy is a huge thing in South Africa. It was a huge thing. It's how a lot of us got our games. Yes, because we can't was... just go and walk into like any yeah. old game store and get the game that we want. Like, where can you buy Kingdom Hearts in South Africa? Yeah. Like, you can't. Yeah. You have to order it or something and pay ridiculous <laughs> shipping costs. No. I was browsing through the, the classifieds. Uh, it was called Cape Ads. And that was one of the few ways you got your games. Like people would put ads in the paper to advertise burnt games. Oh. And someone was selling uh, the Final Fantasy. It wasn't. The, it was the anthology NTSC collection, which was uh, five and six with CGI cutscenes and stuff. Oh wow! And I, you know, that's our first time playing it. Really cool. But I mean, that's like I don't want to think about how long ago. Like I even matriculated. That was years ago. <laughs> So uh, yeah, and uh, uh, enjoying the Switch one, it, the load times are so much better on Switch as well, because obviously with the CD format and PlayStation, it's just, oh. it took ages. I've been playing Chrono Cross, 
and um, going into battle, it could take up to like 20 seconds for the transition screen. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, I remember when I had a PS2 emulator on like a really rickety, like old laptop that had like mm. no onboard graphics now, or it just had onboard graphics. And going into each encounter in Final Fantasy X just kind of slowed everything down. It just went, and then it sped up, but very gradually. So there's mm. a version of like the like battle music in the head, in my head that has like a very kind of sounds. It sounds pixelated coming out of those first couple of bars of music. It's ridiculous. That is not one of the best entries. I have yet to finish it. I don't know why. I, I got all the way up to the final boss, which I think was you, Yevon, in Xanarkand. Spoiler alert. Uh, and for I, some reason, I just never went back. I don't know. I need to actually play it again. Mm. I enjoyed it. It was really good. Uh, I don't like Kimari, though, but yeah. Kimari is fine, I guess. Um, I, I'm just not a, a fan of blue mages. I don't think I'm. I'm not a big fan of like the monster skills. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, you can you can completely go through the game without playing Kimari. It's it's absolutely yeah. amazing. Um, one there was one file that he was an absolute monster. Like he could kill absolutely anything. Um, and I don't remember how I did that, and I can't replicate it. <laughs> I re okay, oh shit, sorry. Uh, I remember why I didn't finish it now. I went back, I really wanted to grind and I really wanted to uh, beat all the Dark Aeons. Oh, yeah. And I had beaten Dark Yojimbo because you just cheese Yojimbo with as much skill as possible and he does, you know, does insta-kill. And I think I defeated Dark Bahamut and I was stuck on the three sisters. I just oh. couldn't get past that, and I think that's where I was. I, I think I just stopped. Oh, I see. I couldn't get quite tough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, lately, I actually just finished Oxenfree 2 on mobile. Nice. Um, so I always have to remind myself that Netflix has games, and then I check every now and again, and then, like, proper, like, full-on indie yeah. games on there, and... Um, Oxen Free came out like a couple of weeks ago and I was like, okay, cool. Let me put it on my phone. And I was, I played the first hour and I was hooked. Mm. It was so spooky and atmospheric. And I'm just sitting there going, what the heck is going on? <laughs> like, I couldn't stop. Um, I finished it over the weekend. Uh, and it was, it was really nice also playing it on mobile because mm. I could just wake up, pick up my phone and just stay in bed you know i didn't really have to move or anything i suppose also that's the that's the great draw of you know the switch or steam deck but um then i have to like buy the games on switch and if i have a netflix account then i just have it on my phone <laughs> um yeah it's something i also forget about uh and i think strange the stranger things game is on there hmm. so the truly one i actually need to try it out so oh. I meant to on Game Pass, and then they get left Game Pass and went to Netflix. Um, some free too. I want to pick up at some point as well. Love the first one um, to the point where I own it on every platform that I have. Oh wow! <laughs> that supports wow. it. I didn't play the first one, so now I downloaded the first one. I'm going to go through that one now. <laughs> it's very good. It's very fun. It's got a great soundtrack. Have a good soundtrack. Um, I also downloaded Spirit Fair as well, so I can play it again for like the fourth time. Yeah, I haven't touched that. I, uh, I have a bad tendency on Switch. I guess we all have these tendencies just to buy games and let them sit there. Yep. I've got so many indie games sitting on my Switch. One day I'll get to them. <laughs> and between that and buying like all the Xenoblade games, which I've only played like part of the first one. And... There's too many. <laughs> There are too many. The backlog is real, and then and then especially when you sign on to those other platforms like, uh, you know, PC Game Pass, that whole subscription service. Oh my word! They do have every single Yakuza game on there as well, yeah. which I'm very, very pleased about. I I, I got to the Majima fight in mm -hmm. Like a Dragon, and the gap 
the the skill gap between you just running around and doing quests and that fight was ridiculously huge i was like what <laughs> so <laughs> i got stuck there but it was really fun um but yeah there, there's just a a big backlog now of indie of indie games any game because mm -hmm. of game pass these days and then you got steam sales and <laughs> <laughs> and I've got this thing where I'm very paranoid about games being de delisted, um, especially games that released uh, on Xbox as backwards compatible because mm -hmm. it keeps happening. So whenever I see a physical copy, like in the local secondhand store, I have to buy it, even though I might not have any intention of buying it. So now I have a stack of 360 games I still have to get through. <laughs> and I ended up with Oblivion twice. I don't know how that happened. Uh, I've got all of those. I've still got like a huge PS3 catalog to get through. I've got 3DS to still get through. Wow. DS. Uh, and you still have the consoles it? like there. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> like a whole I, I have the consoles that I can't upgrade. So like the PS3 sits there because nothing else plays the PS3. You know, the PS5 doesn't do it. Mm. At least, um, at least with the Series X. Um, you can play like you've got complete backwards capability, which is astounding. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I haven't found a reason to buy one yet. Uh, I'm not awfully impressed with all the new things that have come out that are targeting the X or the PS5. So Monday, not now. And Monday. it's also a price thing. Oh, like yeah. I paid like four grand for my PS4 and I can't stomach shutting out 13 grand for the ps5 no no i'm also like i i do want to get the digital edition if i want to for anything um yeah. but then then it's that right and then you got to shell out like over a grand for the games that they release on there you know like spider-man 2 or spider-man miles morales or final fantasy 16 which i'm trying to avoid all spoilers for and it's very difficult <laughs> 16 i'm I do want to play it, but I'm not in a rush, and mm. that's because I was burnt really badly with 15. I pre-ordered like the limited edition, the steelbook, and the 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 movie, and I was so excited to play it. And I, I sat down, watched the movie, and I was like, "What the fuck is this?" And then I, I started the game, and yeah, it just did. Uh, yeah, was a little a little too rough without all of those expansions and patches. Um, oh, absolutely. I complain about it, but I've tacked them with the whole damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting on 16. Yeah, yeah. I'm also like, I, I, I did wait for a long time before I got 15 and I played through it mm. and I was like, this isn't really strong, but I, I get that it's cute. They did some really brave story story turns with ignis and like they there was some really like brilliant writing moments but like yep. little little nuggets of beauty um okay yeah <laughs> we're getting way off track um before we we tie off um is there anything that you want to tell to any aspiring devs so these could be devs that are like in the middle of a project or people that are like i've always wanted to get into indie dev or um yeah do you have any like words for them my favorite piece of advice is not mine it's stolen and it's stolen from uh the developer of residual which is no one cares about your game and what he means by that is markets get your game out there just because you like your game doesn't mean anyone else likes it or anyone else will ever know about it you've got to punch yourself as much as possible and you can't leave marketing to the last second. It's, that's just suicide. There's way too many developers that have released their game and then come along and said, like, oh, no one's buying my game. Have you marketed it? Have you put it on sale? Have you done anything? And they're like, no, no. Do Tell the people about your game. <laughs> Please. <laughs> yeah, marketing um, is very strong. Yeah. I've seen I've seen games being like pushed by marketing, like they're fine games. They're not like amazing, yeah. but the marketing has been absolutely like out of this world. I'd also say to players is leave reviews. 
especially Steam reviews, because that helps developers out so much, and it helps with Steam's algorithm to push the game to more people. Even if you don't, even if you just do like a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and you don't write anything, just do something. <laughs> Tell the devs if you like the game or not. It really helps out. All right. That's some good advice for, for devs and players alike. So um, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast. Um, I'm so happy that you so readily agree to be here on our very first podcast of Indie Scene. We're really excited. Uh, before thank you, you leave. Much. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, before you leave, uh, where can people find you if they want to? Usually at home. Um, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, you can find me on Twitter at the Graham ZA. Uh, I'm also on threads, the Graham ZA. I'm on Instagram, the Graham ZA. I'm on Discord, the Graham ZA. Otherwise, you can go to my website, which is grahampeter.co.za. And I think that's all the places. Yeah. That's all of them. That's a, that's a lot yeah. of them can find it everywhere <laughs> so thank you again cool thank you very much all right and that's it for our first episode of the indie agenda thank you everyone for listening or watching wherever you found this podcast you can find me online with the tag kez underscore lequescent almost anywhere instagram twitter or x whatever it's called uh youtube that's everywhere uh, if you're really happy with what you heard then by all means leave a like drop a comment leave a review i appreciate each and every single one of them uh, i also have a coffee if you would like to support that way also uh, my link tree is in the description below with all of the relevant links finally i want to give a big thanks to uh, my community manager wolf who did a lot of work in helping me to put together this podcast of indie agenda which is uh he also kind of came up with the name of uh of it and i was like no i don't like indie agenda and then i sat and thought about it for like a day and then i thought okay no it, it actually works indie agenda is a fantastic name so thank you wolf and um thank you all for watching i'll see you all next month bye